All right, so let's get down to the activity. We're going to say to students, I'm going to break you into two groups, group A and group B. And group A is going to think about and develop arguments for or against the question, there's always a long time between earthquakes. Group B are going to develop arguments for and against uh, the statement that earthquakes are always large and they're always destructive. One of the things that you're going to want to lead them through is the vocabulary associated with these questions. What does destructive really mean? What counts as a large earthquake? Are all large earthquakes destructive? What about earthquakes that happen in rural areas? You can have a large earthquake that happens where there's not a lot of human habitation, not a lot of human structures that doesn't cause a lot of damage. Alternately, you can have very small earthquakes that happen in uh, very populated areas that cause tremendous amounts of damage. Also, what counts as a long time? You know, turtles live a long time and dogs live a long time, but those lengths of time are different. So think about the way uh, those questions are structured. Now also think about what information the students are going to need to collect in order to answer those questions. It's different, right? So if you want to know how long it is between earthquakes, what's the fundamental question that they're trying to answer? It's a question about time. And what part of this model is the time component? It's the pulling. It's not very straightforward. So when you're pulling, you're storing up uh, elastic energy, potential energy in here, right? That takes time. So however much you pull on this is going to be the time component. And we're going to be thinking about that in centimeters per year, just to make the math easy. What about the magnitude? So as you've probably already figured out in your own head, it's very intuitive that when it moves a lot, it's a big earthquake. When it moves a little bit, that would be equivalent to a small earthquake. So you have a very fundamental idea that the distance that the block itself moves is related to the magnitude. So the distance that this is going to move, and we're going to measure everything along here, is going to be the magnitude. So those two groups are going to be collecting different information. Hopefully, they'll be able to get to that point with your help. For you and I, we're going to go ahead and collect both types of data right now. So I'm going to go ahead and write up here on the board. We're going to have the slip, which is how far the block moves. And then we're going to have, I'm going to call it the pull, just so it's not confusing. But that's actually the time component. And these are going to be measured in centimeters. I'm going to collect three data points. I want you to collect 30 data points so that you have a statistically significant population to work with. OK, so I'm going to start this block right here. I've covered up with my tape. So I'm starting at 7 centimeters. I'm going to say starting at 7. And then I'm going to use this very end of my um, sandpaper here as my reference point for pulling. OK, so that's starting at 77. That worked out well. 77. OK, so I'm going to pull until there's an earthquake, and then I'm going to measure. All right. So that moved to 69. I pulled to 69. And the block, the leading edge of the block, moved from 7 to 16. OK. Now we'll do it again. So 69. And now I'm going to pull. All right, that was a smaller one. That moved to 62. So from 69 to 62. And the block slid, the leading edge of the block slid to 23. So it was at 16, and it slid to 23. Now I'm going to pull this again to 69, which is where it was. All right. And oh, that was a small one. Totally counts. So that was at 60. So that went from 62 to 60. And the block slid to 25. So from 23 to 25. And of course, these values aren't the ones you want. You want to know the difference between them. So in this case, This would be 9 centimeters of slip. OK. And so for the pull, the amount of time, this is only 2, and this is 7, and this would be, what, 8? So what we have in the end, our slip is 9, 7, 2, and the amount of time that passed, this would be 8 years, 7 years, and 2 years. OK, so now if you could go turn off the video, make sure that you get 30 data points, 
and then we'll do a data review together. By now, you should have 30 points that you charted while making your earthquakes with the earthquake machine. In order to plot those up, you're probably going to want to create a histogram, like the one that you see on the screen. The first thing you're going to want to do is figure out how you want to group your earthquakes. We call this binning. So you're going to want to find a distribution that looks good and is showing all of the information in a reasonable way. The way I've grouped it is I put earthquakes that were between magnitude 0 and 2 centimeters into one group and so on up to my highest magnitude earthquake. In this particular case, I have the magnitude of the earthquakes on the x-axis and the number of earthquakes on the y-axis. You would do this the same way uh, with your frequency data or the time between your earthquakes. You would have the time between earthquakes on the x-axis and the number of earthquakes on the y-axis. So if you want to pause the video for a moment so that you can plot up your histograms of earthquakes, you can do that on a piece of graph paper or even in Excel if you have that functionality. Okay, now that you've plotted those up, let's think about the, the statements that we asked the students earlier. Group A, there are long periods of quiet between earthquakes, and Group B, most earthquakes are huge, deadly, and destructive events. And they were supposed to develop arguments either for or against these statements based on their experiments with the earthquake machine. Now that we have the data nicely plotted, let's look and see what we found out here. So Group A was looking at time. Remember, we had decided that was when we were pulling um, the block and the strain was accumulating in the rubber band. That was our time component of the model. So looking at the time between events, or earthquake frequency, we can see that the majority of these events occurred within a relatively short time interval. And that's what we see with global earthquakes as well. So you can expect this to be the finding uh, that the students would have. Now if we think about the other question, most earthquakes are huge, deadly, and destructive events, we had determined that, that was related to magnitude, which was how much the block was going to slip. So if we look at that information, uh, it looks like the majority of these earthquakes were pretty small events, and that's what you would expect to see. Lots of smaller events with the occasional large event. So that's what you can expect the data that the students generate to look like. It's also important uh, to discuss with them, as we had mentioned earlier, the language that's used here to talk about the vocabulary. You know, most earthquakes are huge, deadly, and destructive, but are all large earthquakes destructive? Does an earthquake have to be large in order to be destructive? What exactly do we mean by long periods of quiet? Are we talking about geologic time? Are we talking about human time? So you can take this conversation in a lot of different ways. Make sure that they're really engaging with this uh, on several different levels. So now that they've discussed the earthquake frequency, as well as the earthquake size distribution, I want you to ask them a third question the whole class, and let them interrogate this in their own way. I want you to ask them, if there hasn't been an earthquake in a long time, will the next one be huge? So what's that question really asking? What it's asking about is the frequency and the magnitude, the relationship between those two things. And you can interrogate that question by plotting the years between earthquakes on the x-axis and the magnitude of earthquakes on the y-axis. This is something you're going to want the students to come to on their own, to figure out exactly what different uh, parameters they're going to be looking at in order to answer this question. So this would be sort of a bonus question to tie the whole activity together. So there's some other things that you can do in the classroom with the earthquake machine. We can explore some questions a little bit more deeply. For instance, let's talk about earthquake prediction. What sort of things do we need to know in order to predict earthquakes? We need to know when the earthquake is going to happen, we need to know where it's going to happen, and we need to know how big it is. So based on their experiments, you might want to ask your students questions about earthquake prediction. With their experience with the model, were they able to predict whether earthquakes were going to be large or small? Were they able to predict exactly when they were going to happen? Let's try it now. So for instance, is this going to be a big one or a small one? Kind of medium. Is it going to be a long time before the next earthquake, or will it happen quickly? That one happened faster than I thought it would. So even using this very simple model, just sandpaper and a block, we're not able to adequately predict earthquakes. So if you're thinking about societal problems and the relevance of this in, say, warning huge populations that an earthquake's coming, you can't say it's going to be, you know, oh, maybe. You would have to say it's going to be exactly this day at exactly this time. We just can't do that. And this model demonstrates kind of why that is.
Another thing we can look at is how changing the friction along a fault surface changes how much uh, strain we have to put into the system. So if we put another block on top of this one, what are we doing? We're increasing or decreasing the friction. We're increasing the friction. So we should have to pull the block harder for a longer time in order to get it to slide. Now what happens if I were to put a little bit of strain into this and then reduce the friction suddenly by removing a block? So there's strain building up in the system and now I'm going to remove this block and an earthquake happens. Can you think of some scenarios in the real world where, where we're reducing friction on a fault? What about uh, the man-made or induced earthquakes that are happening in the Midwest right now? They're putting uh, some water into the ground, which is reducing the friction on some fault surfaces and causing earthquakes to occur. This also happens when you have multiple fault systems that are close by. If you have an earthquake on one fault, it can change the stress on another fault and either make an earthquake more likely or less likely. Another thing you can try is adding a second block onto the back of the first using an additional rubber band or even two. We're going to set up a scenario that's very similar to the San Andreas Fault in California. The San Andreas Fault has five different sections and these sections all independently uh, have earthquakes on their own. So how does that actually work? We have the plate that's moving, it's building up strain so we see that there's some strain building up in between these two plates also. When is the second one going to go and are they going to slide together? Let's do that again and see if we get the same behavior. So what are the implications of this fault behavior? Sometimes you get an earthquake on only one block, but other times you get an earthquake on both blocks. So when this one block would move, that would be a large damaging earthquake. But if both blocks were to move, the magnitude would be increased, and that would be a much more devastating event. So in review, today we defined an earthquake in order to highlight students' current knowledge of and misconceptions about earthquakes. We explored the earthquake machine and determined how it was like and unlike the Earth and what all of the components inside the model represented. We gathered some data using the earthquake machine, and then we plotted that data, looked at earthquake size and recurrence, we use the data to develop an argument for or against a position, and then we outline some additional uses for the earthquake machine. I hope you enjoyed learning about the earthquake machine. Thank you for joining me.